All right, so last time we talked about uh, farm pond management strategies, and there's a lot of these that have been developed in different ways. You can stock fish and all of those things we talked about. And we're going to talk today a little bit about reservoir management strategies. Don't have as many of these. You know, reservoirs are big bodies of water, and so you sort of have a general idea, but you kind of attack the problem species by species. Whereas you might think in a farm pond, I might want to have just big bass, or I might want to have just catfish. In a reservoir, it's like, why aren't the bass bigger? Or, or you still have kind of the same general strategies, but you tend to think about it in terms of, a, of an individual species. Doesn't matter. Basically, this is just going to be a short lecture to introduce you to some different concepts that are only appropriate for the reservoirs. Um, just a short thing on construction, short thing on stocking, and just a couple of different things that, that really you can only do in a reservoir. Just some terminology here. In general, we like to say that a lake is a natural water body. And so although we have Argyle Lake, Spring Lake, everything is named with a lake, we actually like to think of a lake as something that was formed by uh, a glacier or an earthquake or what have you. Um, these are kind of rare in Illinois. Most of the water bodies, the, the uh, Lentic water bodies anyway, are human made. In Illinois, the IDNR defines anything less than six acres a pond. So if you wanted to know what's the difference between a pond and a reservoir, as far as Illinois is concerned, there you go. Um, and I don't know if this is an arbitrary number or if they looked at the distribution of sizes and decided six was a good cutoff, doesn't matter. This is just sort of the general idea. If you've got more than six acres, we're going to call that a reservoir. Now, another thing, uh, terminology you need to be familiar with, is that if you dam up a river, you have a couple of different things that you can call the resulting water body. If the acreage at least doubles when you dam up that river, then you're going to call that a reservoir. So, for example, Carlisle Lake. is a dam, There's a dam on the Kaskaskia River. If you look to the surface area of the Kaskaskia before and after damming, clearly it more than doubled. Carlisle Lakes, the uh, biggest reservoir in the state. Um, however, if the acreage does not double, then we call that a pool. And so pool 19, pool 20. Um, so there you go. That's how come that's the difference between a pool and a reservoir. They both are formed by a dam. Remember that pools are named by the dam that forms them. Pool 19 was formed by Lock and Dam 19. So pool 19 is above Lock and, lock and Dam 19. Pool 20 is above Lock and Dam 20, and so on. Okay. This is just some basic data on reservoir construction in the U.S. And you see that um, it kind of peaked in the 70s and then has been dropping and dropped pretty rapidly in the 80s. And we can think of a few reasons for that. Um, the biggest is, is pretty much all the places where we could build a big reservoir, we have built a big reservoir. Uh, the, there's always the temptation to dam up a stream. You know, the streams often have a lot of value, um, but they're often non-game fish. A lot of people don't, don't really associate uh, a, a stream or a small river. They don't put a lot of value on that, but a nice big lake and waterfront property and boating and fishing and skiing, people in America put more value upon that. That's just how it is. Now, um, we can explain to people why those streams and those non-game fish, those native fish, are important. And um, But it's really kind of a moot point because pretty much anywhere where we could build a big reservoir, we have built them. Uh, another reason that reservoir construction is slowing down, land prices. Land prices are through the roof, especially agricultural land out here. And so it's much more valuable to people to not build these reservoirs because the land is just too expensive. Now, usually when a new reservoir is built, you get really good fishing 
for the few, first few years. Uh, it's just incredible, those first few years. And there have been some reasons proposed for this. Uh, the first is you've got uh, lots of nutrients available. So your food web and your, your reservoir is very productive because you've got all this terrestrial land. A lot of times it's farmland. Anyway, when you flood it, there's just all those nutrients in the soil and all that biomass decomposing and the water is just full of nutrients and you get this big algal, algal bloom. And, and so that's um, kind of a bottom up explanation for why the fishing is so good. It's because your productivity is great, but as the lake ages, you know, a lot of those nutrients are going to get locked up in the sediments as things die and, and sink to the bottom. Then when it goes anoxic, the stuff gets locked up, or when it's, I guess when it goes into anoxic, a lot of it gets released. Um, but nutrients get locked up in the sediments. Also, nutrients get locked up in bigger fish. You know, you got all these fish that are growing like crazy, but as the lake ages and it's a fish age, you get these older bass, these older fish. And, um, but mostly it's the nutrients getting locked up in the sediments. Um, an alternate explanation or uh, corresponding, maybe it's going on at the same time, it's kind of a top-down explanation, is that you just got a lot of very vulnerable forage early on. You're creating, you're damming up a stream, and that stream usually is filled with lots of native minnow, darter species, very vulnerable forage. And so in those first few years, you've got this simplified food web with the usually largemouth bass at the top, and they just go crazy, and they can wipe out a lot of these species. And of course, that's why we don't stock them fathead minnows with largemouth. They can wipe them out. So this is probably why you get really good fishing when you first construct a reservoir. But as we said, we're not really constructing many reservoirs anymore these days, so you may never see this. All right, stocking of a reservoir. So in a farm pond, usually the fish are at least a few months old uh, at the fingerling stage. Uh, I, I'm using the terminology fry for the newly hatched larval fish and then fingerling for when they're a little bit uh, larger and can swim on their own and things like that. Um, sometimes you put grown adults in there because it's possible. You've got a small pond, you might be able to catch enough fish and bring them over and dump them in to make a difference. You might, um, you might actually be able to afford to purchase larger fish because you don't need, relatively, you don't need a large amount. Um, and so it makes it affordable to stock a farm pond at a reasonable sized fish. In reservoirs, you need huge numbers. You just can't stock a reservoir like you can a pond and immediately expect that food web to develop. Of course, we stock reservoirs and maybe when you first build one you might stock some to get um, to help give it a boost but really the numbers of fish we're talking are not sustainable by stocking they need to have reproduction if you want to have a sustainable fishery um, a lot of different ways that you can stock a lot of, of research into what's the best size and the best time and the best way to stock um, I know a lot of this has been done on walleye because they're about the most widely stocked fish because a lot of times the walleye won't reproduce in a reservoir but they're really highly valued and so on and so forth. If you stock the fry, that's really cheap um, because you can stock literally hundreds of thousands if not millions. I mean you're talking eggs, how many eggs can one female produce? And so you can have huge, huge numbers. Excuse me. I forgot I had a timer on uh, for something going on in the lab. Um, so you can stock huge, huge numbers, uh, but there's a couple problems here. You're going to have very poor survival. Remember when we talked about mortality and, and first year life has got you know, tremendous mortality. Well, you're talking fry, you might get 99% of them to die. Um, so that's, although you can stock, it still could potentially be a large number that, that um, will survive, but also how do you evaluate this? At that size, it's certainly impossible to tag them with any kind of tag. 
oxytec recycling might be a good option, but a lot of times that's too expensive or people can't, um, or people just don't have the equipment for that. So evaluating the success of your stocking can be difficult. Also, they're very touchy at that size. And it could be just a matter of if it's a little too hot or a little too low oxygen, you might have hundreds of thousands that just all die immediately. So um, there's the, the upside and the downside there. For fingerlings, you're going to get better survival because they're less vulnerable, they're tougher, but they have to spend more time in the hatchery. And that means they're going to be more expensive. You've got to feed them that whole time. And you're also going to get more hatchery selection. So the fish that do well in the hatchery do well for a reason. It's because they're well suited to a hatchery, but they, they might not be well suited to a reservoir. And the longer they're in that hatchery eating that prepared food, the more comfortable they are with humans and the more reliant they are on that prepared food. And they may be really dumb and really vulnerable when they're stocked into the reservoir. Sometimes, in some situations, you will be stocking adult fish. Best example is like a put and take fishery like the catchable trout program. And you know, like the trout they stock in Argyle Lake or all around Illinois. That's where the the uh, economics has worked out um, because you've got people buying trout stamps and spending extra on their license and trout fishermen tend to spend a lot of money and uh, they're satisfied with uh, a moderately sized fish and they don't need to catch a whole lot. So um, that makes trout stocking affordable and, and you stock the adults because you know, clearly you're not any reproduction going on with the trout. So um, that's really about the only situation I can think of where you would uh, continuously stock adult sized fish. Okay, last I just want to talk about a few strategies that are appropriate for a reservoir. Realize that in reservoirs you've got a lot more money available. Instead of one person having to fund the whole thing, you've got tax money, you've got lake association fees, you've got user fees, you've got a lot of money to do bigger projects. But you also have to please everybody who's paying that money. So the people who are buying gas and then who's uh, uh, wallet bro tax on that gas helps to fund this or the the you've got the the boaters um, you've got the recreational people people that just use the parks on the shore excuse me you've got the citizens who drink the water now you've got to make sure all these different constituents are happy and that's part of managing people as part of the fish management mantra and now you've got um, a lot more wider range of potential species. So your crappie, walleye, muskie, white bass, these are all in play now. And so that makes the reservoirs a little bit more exciting and of course complicated. Just a couple of, of strategies that are appropriate for reservoirs. A two-story fishery um, is where you have a warm water species in the epilimnion and a cool water species in the hypolimnion. Uh, pretty much classic example of this is your bass bluegill catfish, traditional fishery, warm water fishery in the epilimnion, then down at the bottom you've got trout. Here in Illinois, the one place I'm aware of this is um, Devil's Kitchen, where you've got a well-established two-story fishery. Uh, you could argue that like when they stock trout in Argyle, that, that would be a two-story fishery, but I don't think it is because I just don't think there's enough oxygen down deep, and that's the key for this to work on a large scale. So this only tends to work in clear lakes where you get light down to the hypolimnion to where you can get some level of productivity to get some oxygen down deep. And of course, if the water's clear, that means fewer nutrients, so you have less productivity in general, less decomposition, so that also assists with having oxygen down deep. One thing about the uh, two-story fishery is those fish that you catch down in the hypolimnion are under a lot of pressure and they're yanked up very quickly. So what's going to happen? Just like a scuba diver coming up to the surface quickly, you've got that gas bladder which has lots of air shoved in it to help keep them neutrally buoyant at very high pressures. But as soon as you rapidly ascend and release that pressure without relieving, you know, without releasing gas from the swim bladder, 
then the swim bladder is going to expand. If you think about a balloon, and then if you blow up that balloon and then go up to the surface, that balloon is going to be under less pressure, and so all that air is going to expand. And that's what happens to the swim bladder. And um, so what that can do is that can call it, that a lot of times that'll cause the stomach to invert and push the stomach and push things out of their mouth, or it can rupture the swim bladder, or it can rupture the stomach. So clearly there, there can be some trauma there. One solution is called fizzing the fish. Um, it's a way of releasing barotrauma, barometric trauma, or trauma from pressure. That's a fancy term that you might hear. And fizzing is basically just taking um, a needle, um, like a syringe with the top off, and just sticking it between the ribs into the swim bladder to relieve that pressure. And um, the idea being that that small wound that they get uh, will likely heal up, and certainly their, their odds are better with that small wound versus uh, you know, putting them back in the water. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to be at the surface, you put them back in the water and their guts are all pushed out. It's going to take a long time for that uh, gas gland to work and to, to get all that gas out of the swim bladder the whole time there. They could be getting damaged. Um, having said that, there has been a lot of research lately into whether or not this actually improves survival. There was a paper not too long ago that suggested that it does not improve long-term survival. So you have to pay attention to that. Usually these are not catch and release fisheries. Usually when you're catching fish from that deep, you're, you've just got a creel limit. You know, the first six you catch, those are your fish because there's just too much trauma involved here. Um, consequently, for like a, a trout fishery down deep, you're going to need constant restocking uh, to replace those fish that the anglers are taking out. Of course, if this is your situation, you can't just back up to the boat ramp and dump them in because it's too hot. So a lot of times they'll have a tube that goes down to the hypolimnion and they'll shoot them down that tube. All right, uh, another thing you see on reservoirs, uh, power plant lakes. Of course, you need water to cool the steam after it turns the generator. So you burn the coal, heat water in the closed loop, that water turns to steam. The steam goes up, turns a generator. The generator generates electricity, but then the steam needs to be rapidly cooled down so it can go back and cycle through that inner loop. So you take lake water, you run it past the inner loop, transfers the heat to that lake water. That helps to cool the inner loop water down. Then you release that hot water into the, uh, into the lake, and then as it cycles through the lake, it releases that heat into the sediments and into the atmosphere. Of course, you get very warm water near the outlet. This is an example of Newton Lake. The, the, uh, this is the power plant there, crude representation. And you see you get this flow, constant large circulation of water. Um, of course, a lot of times you'll see uh, power plants located on a river. And so then, you know, you just put, it, put the discharge back into the river and hopefully it cools down by the time it gets to you down to the next power plant. Uh, the water can be really hot, greater than 40 C at the outlet. And if you can't do that calculation in your head, you know, roughly take centigrade, multiply by two and add 32, that's 80 plus 32, that's 112, it'd be a little bit less than that. If you can remember that human body temperature is 37, and you know that your, that, that your body, that you know, 98 Fahrenheit, so 37C, so this is warmer than your body. I've jumped out into the water near the outlet at Coffeen Lake and and almost felt like I had to jump back into the boat. It felt almost like jumping into a, a hot bath. Maybe a little bit of exaggeration, but it gets hot. But we still get fish up there, so the fish can learn to live with this. But it does cause some stress to them. Uh, the surface is often very hot. You think about that hot water, really hot water. Remember how the density of water changes in a curvilinear manner. So at warm temperatures, the density changes faster. So you get that really hot water. It's going to be very, very low density, and it might just skim right along the surface if they don't mix it in. And that's usually way too hot. Um, of course, there's often no oxygen at the bottom, especially in these lakes they are productive. What happens is you get a squeeze. You get a very narrow band of temperature and oxygen that the fish can tolerate. And of course, fishermen 
might take that to their advantage, but that's, that really reduces the available habitat. And sometimes what happens is, is the fish get trapped, and in Newton this happened a lot, where they'd get up in a cove, and then they'd fire the generator, so you'd get this real hot water coming down the lake, sort of in the outside of the cove, and then it would start to creep into the cove, and before the fish realized it, well, they can't, they got nowhere to go, right? They can't swim out because it's just way too hot out there, and they're in this cove. And so that's a lot of times how we get these minor fish kills. The upside to a power plant lake, of course, is a longer growing season. The bass spawned in Newton Lake, gosh, I want to say early March or something ridiculous like that. They grow year-round. You can get, you know, you can fish them in the winter when you can't fish other places. So that's the upside. Um, another downside, if you get the rapid heating of water, that can get gas bubble disease. So um, I'm specifically thinking of, you know, the, usually you don't get any uh, fish and you don't get many fish in training through the power plant. Usually they're small, but when you dump that hot water into the lake and heat up the surrounding lake, what's going to happen? <coughs> Same thing that happens when you bring cold water in to a warm building in winter. You rapidly heat that water. There's a certain amount of gas dissolved in the water. Hot water can't hold as much gas. And so when you rapidly heat up that water, it has to release that gas. That gas comes out of solution, but if it's inside of a fish, that gas comes out of solution and forms a bubble. It can't get to the atmosphere. Those bubbles are going to catch in the fin rays and in the arteries and you're going to get an embolism and that's gas bubble disease. All right, last thing I want to mention is uh, tailwater fisheries, which you're probably familiar with. Of course, if you've got a large reservoir, you can release water from the dam and if there's enough water constantly running, you've got a stream below the dam or sort of maybe the original stream that you dammed up to create the reservoir is still running and you can create a fishery down there. And if you're releasing from the hypolimnion, then of course that's going to be colder water, and you might be able to have a cool water fishery where there was not one before. Classic example, trout fisheries. Uh, the White River, Arkansas, where I just was, that's a hypolimnetic release. So it's cool water. It actually has um, decent oxygen. You know, cold water is going to hold more oxygen, but you think, wow, you know, this is hundred feet deep at the dam or something ridiculous. There's no way you're getting light down there. There's no way you're getting enough productivity to get oxygen um, down deep. But uh, the water's pretty clear. And I don't know if they still don't know if they get enough oxygen production, but they also can mix uh, water from the metalimnion and the epilimnion to add oxygen back in as they're releasing. There's certain things they can do like that. Sometimes uh, the oxygen just gets trapped there in, during spring turnover, and, and there's not a lot of decomposition. It just stays there until it's released out through the dam. There's a lot of ways. Uh, but then sometimes you can't have oxygen problems. If you're releasing from the bottom of the lake, you might be releasing cold anoxic water, and that could be a problem. Uh, usually, as it moves through the stream, it seems like as it gets physically mixed in the stream and you get some productivity in the stream, you can get some oxygen in and you still, then you'll have the cool oxygenated water that the trout want. Um, so that's the classic uh, tailwater fishery. Of course, you've got unique problems with the tailwater fishery, right? You've got the water quality problems. You have, uh, if it's a generating plant, you've got rapid changes in water depth and discharge and that can be dangerous for fishermen, and that can have an, effect, an influence on the, um, the fish that's in the stream. Of course, if you're creating this cool water fishery, you're pushing out non-native warm water fishes, and that's not always uh, something that we look forward to. So there are unique challenges there as well. Okay, so um, that's a little short thing on reservoir strategies. And that's all I have. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.